And we are back. Let's finish up talking about diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. So let's get right to it. All right. So we will begin with uh, GERD, well, reflux esophagitis. What it means is that the acidic stomach contents are, go backwards up into the esophagus. And the esophagus is wholly unprepared for this. It's, uh, the stomach has mucus, lots of thick layer of mucus, and uh, it's, it renews itself very rapidly. The, uh, the esophagus is not prepared for that. It does not have that thick layer of mucus, and uh, so it's gonna burn the, issue, the uh, esophagus. So very common. Um, um, this GERD, this acid reflux. Um, yeah, and so you'll see it especially uh, people uh, drink, uh, smoke, obesity, and pregnancy kind of related. Um, uh, it's also involved with hernias too, but if you, if you have lots, imagine you have your diaphragm with your, your lungs above it, and then if your guts are really pushing down, it's going to push your stomach up. And so you, you really, after you eat, you shouldn't lay down also because it's gonna allow this to happen more if you have GERD. You wanna sit up or stand up because gravity will help uh, keep those stomach acids from going upwards too. You should have that lower esophageal sphincter keeping it closed, but if you've got a bunch of weight behind it, pushing on the stomach, you're gonna have some leakage upwards. Definitely. And Really, really cool. So what we're looking at here is the light pink is normal. That's the stratified squamous. We're looking down, we're looking down the esophagus and the stomach is gonna be in there, right? It should be a sphincter holding it closed. But in this case, that more uh, salmon colored or darker uh, layer is the stomach epithelium, columnar cells that's coming up. And the stratified squamous is changing to the stomach epithelium. And uh, uh, we'll see, it's called a Bartlett's uh, esophagus. And uh, this changing, this metaplasia, this changing of one tissue uh, to another in response to this constant irritation can be a precursor to cancer when you, you have metaplasia or changing of cells like this. And it's gonna be a precursor to erosion through there and maybe bleeding. Now, occasionally heartburn, if you eat way too much, eat spicy food, it feels like heartburn because it's, it's up here behind your heart, but of course it's your esophagus. Um, this reflux is not, not, doesn't cause any damage, it's very, very common. But it's if you have it consistently with each meal, then it starts doing chronic long-term damage to your, the uh, end of your esophagus. And Barrett esophagus is a condition that is a little familiar. We're looking at that, where you have a changing, where that epithelium goes from being esophageal squamous to being um, columnar stomach epithelium. And it's gonna, it's gonna keep, uh, you can follow it as it's gonna keep uh, coming upwards. And because of that, like I say, you have a really good chance of having some um, adenocarcinoma, uh, cancer of the, the glands in, in there. Uh, so they gotta watch that carefully. And what also can happen is that, you know, it can cause uh, this erosion, can cause scarring, and then you end up with scar tissue and it's kind of a narrowing. And so you have uh, dysphagia and you have pain because your esophagus is kind of closing up down there. So a lot of issues, issues right there. So what you can do is, uh, of course, uh, uh, eat uh, um, things that don't cause this acid reflux. Um, so you see this hot pepper here, spicy foods are an issue. Uh, eating just a few large meals can do it too, because you're you're just taking up all the space in your stomach and the fluid can come out smaller meals, spread out will help as well. On the drug side of thing, we call these PPIs, protein pump inhibitors. Remember when you make acid, you're, you're pumping out hydrogen ions and chloride ions. And a hydrogen ion is a proton. So it's simply gonna inhibit you making more hydrogen ions so it'd be less acidic. And you can take um, 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 over the counter, uh, um, uh, pills uh, that are going to uh, neutralize the acid, their uh, uh, antacids. Um, and that works as well, but this is a drug that works directly on your stomach. If it gets really, really serious, they can also do things like cut your vagus nerves going to the stomach because that promotes secretion and digestion. 
but this bread esophagus, like I say, uh, it's a it's a condition where uh, uh, they really got to watch it and, and just frequently watch it because uh, it can, can turn cancerous and it's pretty deadly, this esophageal cancer. So that's where they really worry and they worry about scarring and they worry about bleeding, you know, when you have that, that issue. All right, gastritis means a stomach infection. Uh, and what you're gonna have is a, uh, uh, the, the mucosa, that nice lining. And you guys that are healthy, their stomach has mucus, you're always renewing it and you know, the food moves along. But if it's, if it's inflamed, you have stomach pain, gastritis, and then it can, it can lead to uh, some other issues. Um, you know, what, would it, what would bother your stomach? Um, you've heard aspirin probably does this, right? So NSAIDs, aspirin, ibuprofen, uh, and alcohol, alcohol too. Uh, it's, it's not good for gastritis or acid reflux. Um, and normally, you know, your stomach, like I say, it's, it's the epithelium is refreshed once a week because it's such a harsh environment. You always make new epithelial cells come from the base up. They're replaced. You make this mucus that has bicarbonate ions that are helping neutralize the acid and you have this, this protective layer. But you can overwhelm it with gastritis. And what you're going to see is pain. Epigastric means up in this region and uh, nausea, vomiting. Acute gastritis, yeah. And that hopefully should come and go. Chronic gastritis means that you have, it's a chronic disease. We'll talk about two um, issues with this. The first here is the rare, you know, the other one's 90% of the cases, but only 10% of the cases you have this autoimmune disease um, that we believe destroys the cells in your stomach epithelium. And uh, it's called fundal gastritis because it tends to happen in the fundus or the body, the top of the stomach only. The other most common one is caused by the Helicobacter pylori bacteria. That can happen anywhere in the stomach and even down into the, the duodenum. But uh, this autoimmune happens just in the top of the stomach. They see this. And if you do a biopsy, you can see nice healthy stomach. Look at that deep glands. And then here is a atrophy of the epithelium for sure. And so your body is killing away your stomach lining. Yeah. And you guys should be able to put this all together if you don't have your cells, the parietal cells deep in your uh, stomach glands, you're not going to make intrinsic factor. And you need that to absorb which vitamin? B12, right? And you get pernicious anemia because you need vitamin B12. Yeah. But gastritis is usually caused by uh, a bacterium, this uh, Helicobacter pylori. And um, uh, it can also it can cause gastritis and it can cause ulcers. You're going to talk about these holes that are going to be just burned into the, uh, um, your stomach, your duodenum, or your esophagus. But it turns out they do these uh, broad studies, and they found that a lot of people have this, carry this, this bacteria. And you can see most are asymptomatic. You right now can have helicobacter bacter growing in your stomach, and you don't have gastritis, you don't have ulcers. So it's often asymptomatic. But when you become symptomatic, you'll feel stomach pain. You'll feel that pain, loss of appetite, yeah, because you have the bacteria making an infection in your, um, in your epithelium. So yeah, what an interesting uh, bacteria here that we're learning more and more about. Uh, here's a study I, I just read, <clears throat> and it was in China, and I looked at a whole bunch of people. And they could tell if you had, had the bacteria, they had this breath test, real, really fancy, I'll talk about it in a minute. But um, look at most prevalent infective agent worldwide. So yes, helicobacter is successful. It lives in acidic environments. No surprise there, right? So it's living in your stomach. And uh, we don't know how it's transmitted. Like is it food, water, how, it's, how people are getting this. Um, interesting. But it turns out when you get older, you're more likely to have it. And then the study and others found these correlations. You see... Uh, poor crowded rural areas, uh, more of this bacteria. And even different ethnicities and more education, less bacteria. Environmentally, it's, it's gotta be related to not genetics. Um, so you can look at that study if you're interested in it, but uh, pretty cool looking at this uh, prevalence of this bacteria. And you can see it grows in the stomach and uh, it's discovered as the major cause of gastritis and ulcers. 
So what can you do? Turns out antibiotics work well. You can uh, take antibiotics. Uh, it's gotta be taken for a week or two. So there's some issue with compliance. People stop taking it. But if you take your antibiotics, you can, you can kill off the H. pylori. You can be reinfected with it in the future again. It's very, very common to happen, but you can uh, get rid of it if you've, you've got some severe gastritis. And then uh, PPIs will also help you uh, ease the symptoms of gastritis because you're making less acid. Another issue here is that uh, sometimes this infection can uh, cause uh, lymphoma or cancer in the, uh, um, the immune cells right underneath the mucosa. And so, uh, and that can spread. So it's true, the book mentions the only cancer treatable antibiotics. Because early on, if you, if you stop the helicobacter infection, you can, you can stop this uh, cancer event. So how do they know you have uh, helicobacter pylori? Well, you can, do, you can look for, if you have it, you've got antibodies because uh, um, your, uh, your body has tried to fight it off. It has antibodies, so you can look at that. Um, and then it's interesting, this bacteria, it has the ability to break down urea into ammonia and carbon dioxide. And so we can use that. You can take a sample of gastric juices and you can, you can say, oh, I've got the bacteria. We can actually see the bacteria. If you get, go in and take a sample, oh, you can grow the bacteria. Say, oh yeah, you have it because we found it there, right? Um, and then this uh, breath test, they give you, um, they label and make heavy carbon in the urea. And then it turns out this bacteria has this unique metabolism that we can exploit. It breaks it down into uh, carbon dioxide. And that carbon in the carbon dioxide is heavy, it's labeled. And so they can do a breath test. You, you put in this machine and like, oh, you have the breakdown product that only really this bacteria can make. So anyway, cool little you know, rapid way to assess this bacteria's prevalence in the um, uh, population you're looking at. All right, ulcers. When you guys think ulcers, what do you think of? I always thought stress, you know, oh my God, all this, taking the summer course pathophysiology, there's so much, I'm gonna get an ulcer, you know, worrying about it and studying, and yeah. Well, turns out it's this damn bacteria is the major cause of ulcers. Uh, uh, stress doesn't help either. You're gonna be, it's gonna influence your um, acid production and such. But imagine you have <clears throat> the acid, it had the ability if the epithelium is damaged, so that acid and those enzymes, the pepsin that breaks down protein, to erode a little hole in the wall of your stomach. Ah, it just sounds painful, doesn't it? And so a, a hole will erode. And then you can see here this granuloma tissue here, and then this region, the blood around here. And you know, it's hard to heal that. I mean, uh, ulcers can heal. You can take antibiotics, get rid of the bacteria issue. Your body will heal it. Uh, but sometimes they're just persistent. And if, if they keep eroding the wall of your stomach or esophagus, they'll hit an artery. And then if they erode the wall of the artery, you're gonna have arterial blood under pressure pumping out. And then that's a cause of death when you, for ulcers. Yep, so these ulcers, you find it uh, a lot and just the, where the duodenum just, the intestine just comes out of the stomach, but the stomach and even in the esophagus when you have that GERD. Yeah. And ulcers uh, cause quite a bit of pain, right? Pain could be blood. Oh, yeah, that's a serious bleeding ulcer, as you can see. Look at the blood forming. Again, you hit an artery, as the blood's gonna pour out, right? And so, uh, major issue. See, nausea, vomiting, bloating, burning, pain. Uh, you can have weight loss. Yeah, iron deficiency anemia. Any kind of slow leak of blood is gonna, um, you're gonna lose that and you're gonna uh, be anemic. All right, so you can see here that uh, even 20% of people that, uh, that, that, that have the pylori uh, gastritis, they don't have the ulcers. So it's not automatic you're gonna get an ulcer. But people that do have ulcers, you can see. It says here, these stats are three quarters of the people with ulcers have the bacteria. So it's the major cause is having this bacteria causing that infection. Yet there are some medical conditions that alcohol, alcoholism too makes you more likely to have uh, uh, ulcers. And then, yeah, you take a lot of aspirin, definitely smoking steroids. 
So what can we do? Well, if the ulcer is not healing, even in antibiotics, it's a surgical intervention. You got to go in there and uh, maybe cut out that area, sew it back together, definitely. But PPI is to prevent more acid secretion, try to help out on that end, um, figure out what's causing the ulcer, again, antibiotics, right? Because uh, they'll often come back, people with these peptic ulcers. All right, so that's it with ulcers. Um, yeah, painful situation. So malabsorption means you're having trouble absorbing nutrients. And rarely is this such a big problem that you die right away. You know, like you can, you can live a day without getting you know, absorbing nutrients. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, but you can have issues, especially malabsorption of certain vitamins and stuff. It's a, a chronic kind of thing that's gonna pop up if you can't uh, absorb your food properly. In many cases, it can be like an enzyme, like a lactose intolerance, where a lactase enzyme is, is screwed up so you can't do that. Uh, or you can see many different ways where you can't absorb properly the nutrients. So again, uh, a lot of genetic diseases are such where it changes the protein in the enzyme, it's misshapen and the enzyme doesn't work. So you have problems absorbing fats or certain sugars you can't break down, et cetera, et cetera. If your pancreas has an issue, you can't make enough pancreatic juice. That's where a lot of your enzymes come from, indeed. Uh, infectious diseases, uh, these are uh, bacteria that are such that are uh, competing with your normal natural bacteria and causing problems absorbing nutrients. Autoimmune definitely can break down your own uh, epithelium of your gut. Um, if they remove a bunch of small intestine, the small bowel syndrome where you, you need a certain amount of small intestine and you can't absorb enough nutrients. And as you get older, you have just degeneration of the epithelium, just less and less active, and so you absorb less and less nutrients. Yeah, and for instance, the interesting one is this maybe some of your lactose uh, intolerance. And uh, this whole ability to, that we drink, the idea that we drink milk as adults, we're the only mammal that does that. You don't see a little squirrel or a deer as an adult looking for a glass of milk, right? I mean, they drink it as babies and then they wean themselves. And so most mammals make lactase, the ability to break down milk sugar, young, and then they stop making that enzyme. But there was some population, we think in Northern Europe, that uh, had a mutation that there was selection for them to retain the ability to digest milk as adults. And uh, that kind of uh, spread, it was successful enough because I think we think during times of famine, this ability to drink milk, and they had ant, uh, cows and goats and things like that, the ability to drink milk and not get sick because even lactose tolerant people can eat cheese or milk, it just makes them bloat. Because you can't break down the sugar, the bacteria end up breaking it down and making gas and making you uncomfortable. So 35% of the world population um, is just not is lactose intolerant. Uh, and you look here, you can see uh, big areas here in, in Southern Asia and Africa. And I remember we had a program where we gave like processed cheese to Africa to help the starving and the, <laughs> they made it bloated and sick because they couldn't digest the, the, the milk as adults. And you think about uh, Asian food, they don't know a lot of cheese. You know, it's not like Italian food, not a lot of cheese or milk is involved. And so, yeah, you don't really think about it, but Americans, we drink a lot of milk products and uh, a little strange. Um, a lot of, from that Northern European ancestry of some Americans, um, of course, um, uh, we take with us this ability to digest milk that allows some of our ancestors to survive because we could steal it from our from animals, camels and cows and goats. Yeah, there's a cool article here uh, if you guys want to look into that. All right, big topic is celiac disease. This, you go, can't go anywhere without, is this gluten-free? Is that gluten-free? Uh, it turns out there's a lot of people think they're glucose, they're gluten intolerant, and they're not. They just, it's, it's so difficult because you think, oh, I stopped eating bread, I feel better. Well, you might have felt better for some other reason. And uh, a lot of it's in your head. But of course, it's true. Yeah, of course, there is absolutely this, uh, uh, this issue with gluten is a real thing. But I've just, studies have shown that more people think they're, 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 uh, they can't eat gluten than can. It's just 
they've uh, bought into this this idea that it's it's an issue. Um, yeah. Anyway, but gluten is a, is a protein in, in wheat, so you can look at societies that eat a lot of wheat. Uh, and let's see uh, this issue, and it works kind of a. Uh, um, it, it's like an allergy in your gut, and it, your body recognizes it as foreign for some people, and it causes an immune response, and the mucosa of your intestine will get all inflamed. And what happens in celiac disease, we're talking about here, is that the villi get atrophy, and it even might turn to flat. So you're not going to, it's a malabsorption disease because you need these villi with their surface area for absorption, but you keep hitting it with gluten and it causes uh, inflammation and the villi just recede and get, now the food just cruises by without getting absorbed. So some issues with it, of course, uh, gas and, and diarrhea um, and malabsorption because your gut's not doing a very good job absorbing and with that, uh, lack of calories. Yeah. So, of course, when you get a, di a diagnosis of this, you change your life to start reading the labels and not having uh, grains and, and normal beer and things that are not gluten free. And that should reverse this inflammation. And uh, yeah, but without it untreated, whenever you have bread and such, it's going to uh, cause damage to your gut. A diagnosis, they do a biopsy. You guys see this? Yeah, you can see how the villi and the epithelium are being destroyed. <clears throat> and you can also just look at uh, in the blood and find antibodies against uh, gluten that tells you, oh, you've had a reaction against gluten, which uh, you shouldn't have a reaction because it's you should just be able to digest it. Same. Yeah, in definitive. If you take away gluten, it gets better. How's that? All right, well, I don't know if you guys have had, uh, you traveled places um, and had uh, uh, bad uh, um, intestinal experiences. But our flora and our gut is ours. And when you throw in some strangers, they often fight and uh, you, you've got some issues. And your body will react, vomiting or diarrhea to try to flush out the bad guys, right? All right, so intestinal infections. Uh, we're mo mainly talking about, like if you go and you drink the water in a place in Mexico you're not supposed to, uh, um, you are, what you're doing is you're, uh, um, uh, even if you have salads or fruit that was washed in water and people with their hands, it's a fecal oral route. So the idea is bad sanitation includes washing of vegetables and stuff. You're introducing that and uh, people there live with it, but you come into this air region without it and you, you have a little fight going on in your, in your in your gut. So these pathogenic bacteria, if you have enough, a uh, high enough dose, you are going to uh, cause this uh, intestinal infection. Small numbers, a few bacteria you can just fight off. Yeah, including diseases like cholera and typhoid or bacteria that live, uh, that can be spread through the fecal oral route through bad sanitation. Yeah, let's take a look at some of these. Yeah, viral enteritis. Oh yeah, I've heard of, heard of some of these. Um, here's the traveler's diarrhea. A lot of it's E. coli, some ones that are particularly, give off some bad toxins. Diarrhea, cramps, you're gonna just feel crappy for like a week. Uh, food poisoning, salmonella, right? Yeah. If you're cutting chicken, don't use the same you know cutting board for your vegetables. Uh, yeah, short, but bad, yeah, acute onset. So right, once you eat the food, you should feel bad after that. And you should see this other people that ate the food should have similar uh, symptoms. So you can see, these are some of the clues why your, your stomach hurts, is if you can put together what happened here. And then dysentery and typhoid are major killers in uh, their ep epidemics in uh, other parts of the world besides the United States um, and uh, killers too especially children, because they end up with diarrhea, and you're like, well, I can survive diarrhea. Well, if you're a kid, you only have so much fluid, and if you don't have an IV, or you don't have saline solution, Pedialyte, you know, all these things, um, 
you're going to die of dehydration, a di diarrheal disease that um, we could have saved you pretty easily if you were the right medical equipment. Yeah, Shigella gives out bad toxins. These are amoebic, yeah, amoebic dysentery. That's actually a um, protozoan, not a bacteria. And of course, you all heard salmonella, right? This particular typhi one causes typhoid fever. <clears throat> so I've taken typhoid pills and traveled to, to uh, Latin America. And cholera also. Uh, cholera is a, is a disease that um, um, we don't hear about too much here. Um, but uh, you can see that can kill you pretty quickly. All right, so get some nasties um, in your body and uh, can make you very uncomfortable. And uh, without medical intervention, some of these diseases are big killers. Let's talk hernias. Well, first of all, a hernia, you can have all kinds of hernias. Um, a hiatal hernia, a piece of your intestine goes up, that hole where your esophagus comes in, it goes up into your chest cavity or your mediastinum, your heart. You can have one out your belly button. You can see here, if you've had a surgery, you can have one out there. It's a hernia is a part of your body that goes where it's not supposed to. You have a brain herniation where it goes down into your frame of magnum or it herniates to the side like that. But here we're talking about your intestines. And if you really strain and stress, um, the part of the intestine can be pushed out places where it's not supposed to go, wherever there's a weakening. And in men, especially, there's a weakening here where the testes descended, they left an opening and it heals, but some people more of an opening than others. And if a loop of intestine goes through there and gets caught, you've got a problem. And uh, it can go out in the leg, ephemeral hernia, or it can go out the, um, where the spermatic cord goes towards, it can go into the scrotum. The doctor and men will have you cough and they'll hold your testes. I always wondered why, why they did that, you know? And it's like they're testing to see if you have a hernia. And it's one of the most common, common surgeries is putting this mesh in there to, to strengthen that so intestines won't call out that hole anymore. All right, appendicitis. And uh, this is um, uh, near and dear. I've got my appendix, but um, my brother John, he, um, when he was, we were just in grade school or junior high, something like that. Uh, my mom would never let us stay home. We couldn't really be sick because uh, to tough it out, <laughs> I was never sick. Um, and so he said, oh, my stomach hurts. I, I go to school. It turned out he had appendicitis and it burst. And so he was in the hospital for, for weeks. Um, yeah. Um, so you do take it seriously. The pain, I'll talk about it here, uh, where it is. Uh, 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 it's, a, it's a serious thing. But this appendix is just a dead end little sack. And it has a hole that comes into your cecum here. And uh, this uh, be can become inflamed, especially if you have a little bit of feces blocks that opening and then uh, the mucus can't escape and uh, it gets inflamed. And you'll feel that pain of, a, of a appendicitis. And hopefully you go to the doctor, um, they can diagnose it and then uh, they can go in and cut it out, you're fine. The big danger is gone. If you don't do anything, it can burst. And then you have peritonitis, bacteria, and then life-threatening. So anyway, this appendix is a little, uh, uh, a little extension off your intestines. It's like really narrow, the size of maybe a Sharpie or something, maybe a little smaller than that. And you see appendicitis, especially in, in kids and adolescents more than adults. Yeah, so what you may see um, is kind of a pain in your, your umbilical your belly button region. And then it'll progress over to that lower right quadrant, and that's the real key. Your pain in lower quadrants could be ovarian too, very common in women, but um, if it's in the lower right-hand quadrant, uh, um, uh, you always have to uh, suspect appendicitis. And then, you know, untreated, you, uh, you won't feel like eating and fever because it's an infection. Um, and then they'll even this rebound pain. And what happens is if you push in on it, doesn't ever let go, and then it hurts as it comes out. That's a really good clue too. You pushed on some nerves, and they uh, you feel that. Yep. You have elevated white blood cells. They can do a sonogram, and they can see your appendix, see where it is, and see if it's inflamed. Definitely. So it is a surgical emergency. It's actually how Houdini died, the great magician. Uh, the, the night before, he was actually punched in the, in the region and it burst. 
he died the next morning. So fun fact. Um, but uh, nowadays they can even do laparoscopic surgery. They put a few holes. They'll inflate your abdomen with CO2 and then they've got instruments and lights and they can just take it out and pull it out this little tiny hole uh, in your belly button. You don't even have a scar. A lot of people have appendectomy scars. Yep. So pretty easy surgery. It's done so often that they know what they're doing. All right, let's move on to IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. This is a chronic inflammatory issue with your bowels or intestines, particularly the large intestine. And there are two related diseases that are very similar, Crohn's disease and ulcerative, ulcerative colitis. And of course, that means colon has ulcers in it, right? And Crohn is a person. Um, and so there's a lot we don't know about, um, about uh, IBD. It's really interesting, but certainly we know there's evidence there's a genetic component. Uh, maybe autoimmune is involved. Um, particular uh, uh, microbes or infections and other things about the environment. So uh, all these things are contributing to this, we believe. So how do you know if it's Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? Uh, 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 mainly it's going to be, you can see the differences where you really find it. Like colitis is only found in the colon, usually this part of the colon here. And Crohn's disease, not only can it be found even in the, the ileum and places, but it often has this kind of cobblestone effect. It's in different places. And this is where your bowel is really inflamed. Um, and uh, you'll have a lot of... Uh, a damage to that uh, to the epithelium and a lot of pain and a lot of issues um, with your bowels. So looking at the two you can see uh, uh, that uh, ulcerative colitis uh, uh, usually just the, the mucosa and this goes all the way through in Crohn's disease. Um, here this Crohn's disease is patchiness um, and often described as this cobblestone effect definitely. Um, and with ulcerative colitis, um, that's the one you see uh, about 5% develop into colon cancer. So they really got to watch that carefully. If you're diagnosed with that, they got to watch for colon cancer as well. Um, yeah, ulcerative colitis might be able to uh, um, uh, cut some of that out. Yeah. Um, surgery contraindicated. So they don't normally go in and cut it out. You might say to yourself, why not? Well, they, they must know that. By doing that, they, they didn't really solve, solve the problem there. So just another view of it, you can see ulcerative colitis in this part of the colon, whereas in Crohn's disease, they show it in many areas kind of um, patchy like that. So what can they do? Um, you know, real severe, they can, they can cut out some of the bad part, but it turns out when they cut out a piece in some of these, that it's almost 100% it, the problem begins elsewhere. And so that's why the issue is they know from history that you can't just, uh, it's not that easy. Um, yeah, and some of the, they use some chemotherapy drugs that prevent rapidly uh, dividing cells, so things they use it with cancer as well, and steroids and uh, anti-inflammatories um, to help just control this, this inflammation in, in your gut. All right, uh, I, I skipped one thing, I, I just, because I wanted to, uh, we don't have so much time, but, uh, but that's uh, inflammatory bowel disease. All right, diverticulosis. I had problems pronouncing that at the last lecture. Diverticulosis, diverticulum. I don't know what the problem was. Um, but these are out pockings, out po little pockets that come off of uh, your colon. And in many cases, they are uh, asymptomatic. You got them, you die with them, right? But they can cause some issues. Um, they can become blocked, inflamed, the walls can weaken and you can have uh, perforations, things like that. But if you have issues with them, uh, yeah, change in bowel habits because it's going on in your colon and then pain, fever, nausea, if there's any kind of uh, infection. This shows one way you can look at it real nicely is to put barium, this liquid in the, in the enema and it fills in every nook and cranny and you can see it'll fill up those uh, diverticulum. And here's a view with a colonoscopy, you can see these openings leading to diverticula. That's a clean colon there. 
Yeah, and so issues, of course, being if these these diverticulum they get clogged up um, or they they get weakened and they burst, and uh, then you're going for immediately antibiotics uh, surgery because you got feces and bacteria in your peritoneal cavity. Yeah, and if you have a problem or it gets really inflamed, it can form scar tissue and it can kind of obstruct. And so your stools will start changing as they've got to get past that obstruction. All right, and finally to cancers. So we'll talk about uh, some neoplasms in, uh, in your GI tract. We already talked about up in the mouth, talking about some uh, cancers in the, the tongue, the larynx, and carcinomas up there. But let's get <clears throat> to, the, uh, to the gut tube here. So you can have esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, colon cancer, anal cancer. So anywhere along here, you can have cancers forming. And it's kind of expected. Um, um, you have epithelial tissue that's rapidly dividing. So like skin cancers, there's chances for mistakes when you have tissues that are rapidly dividing. So you can see why there'd be more of these in like cartilage cancer, things like that. So most of these are colon cancer. Colon cancer is a big killer and uh, we see it more often. Although esophageal cancer is rare, it's also kind of deadly too. Yeah, let's just take, I guess, feast your eyes over this. Take a look from the top to bottom. Esophagus, five years survival, only 20%. Yeah. And causes, yeah, smoking, alcohol, GERD, you're always irritating that tissue. And look at the age of diagnosis is in your 60s and 70s usually. And HPV, the virus, of course, can cause cancer. And looking at the colon cancer, yeah, pretty, pretty good survival rate if they catch it early. And again, the colonoscopy, they can find a polyp before it turns uh, cancerous. Yeah, and I notice they're gonna notice like anal cancer earlier because it's on the outside as opposed to something in your stomach. You have to have other symptoms before they catch it and by then it's a little bit further along. All right, so these polyps, and to me, in marine biology, a polyp, I told you it looks like this, but it kind of looks like that. It's gonna grow out, it doesn't have to have a little finger. Sometimes it does, it looks like well, it has little fingers coming out. But um, uh, these are, it can be a benign growth or it could be malignant. It can be benign and then it can turn to malignant. Um, so they look for these and, uh, and they wanna cut them out when they find them. Um, and normally you, have, you don't notice them unless they get big enough and it, they can bleed or cause obstruction, so your stools become smaller because there's, there's a, the diameter is smaller that they have to get through. So hyperplastic or, or benign uh, are just these growths. So this is a beautiful view of one. This is pretty normal colon epithelium. That's cool, it's just growing like an extra bit, it's coming in right there. Um, but an adenoma is gonna be a cancer of, um, gland cells. And so you look at these and you look, I'm looking at this epithelium like, oh damn, that's a lot of nuclei. Almost like pseudostratified in there. And so very abnormal looking. And, and you look at the whole histological structure is abnormal. So when you <clears throat> do a biopsy of a, of a polyp and you look at it, if you see like normal colon tissue, it's like, oh, it's just kind of an outgrowth. But if you see cancerous signs and you're like, oh, we need to get all of that out of there, right? And it's slow growing. So again, this polyp is absolutely no danger. Even though it's turned uh, uh, to have abnormal cells, it's still okay for years maybe, but eventually it gains the ability to erode through the wall of the colon and then it finds a lymphatic or a blood vessel and it can spread to your liver, your bones, your brain. All right, so we often call it colorectal cancer instead of colon cancer or rectal cancer because they're really, they're the same epithelium on the inside. So it can happen uh, anywhere up there um, towards the end of your digestive tract. Remember carcinomas, cancer of epithelial cells. Uh, sarcoma is connective tissue. Adenoma, adenoma is uh, gland cells. All right, so colon cancer, colorectal uh, cancer. Um, some of it's definitely familiar. We talked about having a genetic uh, uh, components. And when they find like that ulcerative colitis, uh, if you have constant 
the irritation, irritation, it could cause change, cancerous changes in, in the wall. Diet, yes, and so you probably think about this. Talk about a low fi high fiber is good against colon cancer. I'm sure you all heard that. But it's been found that, uh, uh, actually this looks delicious. I'm no herbivore at all. Um, yeah, but steaks, uh, especially, you know, charred meat, but high, a diet high in red meat, and also processed foods, though they got lots of things in our deli meats, stuff like that. So highly processed foods, are found to be a risk factor as opposed to more fruits and vegetables, of course, right? Um, an idea here is that uh, if you're if you're nice and regular with lots of bulk and you then uh, it keeps things moving in your colon and that letting the feces rest for long periods of time against the epithelium that could be uh, damaging to the epithelium. It's an it's an idea. And then looking at colorectal cancer, um, you see that we see it a lot of developed countries and some of the richer countries. Um, looking at the darkness here, you, you see all of Western Europe, see that? And in Canada and the US and Australia, they light up. Places without a lot of colorectal cancer, you see places in, the, in Africa and in, in the, the Middle East and in Central America. So uh, yeah, I imagine it's the environment and diet is having an effect on this. Obviously, the older you are, the greater the risk. Um, yes, obesity and inactivity, smoking, alcohol, diabetes, will all be risk factors for colon cancer. If you have a close relative that of colon cancer, they're probably gonna really recommend that colonoscopy. It's about age 50, they want to do it. So yes, like I say, early, Early uh, diagnosis is the best because like I say, those, some of those polyps are so slow growing, you, you nip it in the bud, you get rid of it before it's, it's able to spread at all. So um, instead of the, uh, putting a scope, putting a tube with a camera up there, uh, they can do a, a, a barrier enema, do a, an x-ray and they can, they can see. Um, um, and even if, they, even if they do, they, if they find something, they really, they gotta go in and look at it. So, um, but it's a, it's a little bit easier to get that than a, a colonoscopy. Um, yep. And this Cologuard test, you can get it in the mail and you can send it out. And uh, it looks for the cells that are shed. It looks for genetic abnormalities, markers for uh, colon cancer. Yeah. Look at detection rate. So a colonoscopy, if they're actually looking at it, it's up near 100%. Like if there's a pop, they're going to see it. You know, if you're a well-trained uh, person. The Cologuard, you can see it's going to miss some of them, isn't it? Yep. And if you do get a positive, then they got to go and actually look at it. You know, they got to you know, make sure. Oh, cool. It's showing, um, uh, in this case, uh, it's constricted there. You've got, in this case, cancer, and it's constricted it. And so the barium enema really showed where, this, where, where it's going on. It's like, oh, okay, got to get in there. And honestly, they'll probably cut off this piece and reconnect it. All right, so um, uh, carcinoma, like uh, we, we've been talking about cancer here, you can see once it, once it's going to metastasize and escape, that's when, uh, that's when the issue is, right? You can see here's a picture of one, you want to see what one looks like in, in gross anatomy. And it is curative if they can cut it out. If they can surgically excise it, you're done. Just like if they can get a tumor out of the lung, you're done. If they catch it early before it's, it's, it's moved away. Um, you can see the staging. Again, I'm not going to ask you specifics of the staging or the test or anything like that, but clearly your best survival is stage one, and it gets worse if they get it in stage four. It's already, they find it in other organs. Yeah. A lot of it has to do with the, how thickness, how far has it gone through the bowel wall? You know, it's, it's going to slowly make its way through. If you can catch it before it gets there, you got it. This, this is a really cool picture. Here we're seeing normal, uh, see all the layers, the muscle, submucosa, and mucosa. Look over here. The layers have just broken down, haven't they? Look at that. It's just broken down, definitely. And even over here, you got a little bit forming on the outside where it's not supposed to. So this is showing uh, uh, rectal cancer or colon cancer, either one, uh, uh, with just a total breakdown of the layers. 
So what are some of the clues? You know, if you didn't get that colonoscopy, what's gonna bring you to the doctor suspecting this? Well, bleeding, when you see fresh blood in the stool, it could be hemorrhoid or it could be a, a, a polyp that's bleeding. Uh, altered bowel habits, definitely. It's gonna be the a clue that might bring you in first that your bowels are wrong. You just, doctor, I don't wanna talk about it. It's not, you know, it doesn't seem, maybe it's important, maybe not. And the first thing is to suspect is, well, let's look, worst case is gonna be looking at colon cancer. Yep. If you're anemic, one thing they look at, the checklist is, uh, is uh, bleeding. And then that's how you become iron deficient anemic. If you're a male in particular, you don't have that, uh, uh, that risk factor of uh, being a premenopausal female. Um, that's something they, they have to look towards. Is it an ulcer or is it a colon problem? And to diagnose it, of course, they just get a sample and uh, look at a biopsy. All right, and lastly, organ failure. What happens when your, your gut fails you completely, right? Well, the absorption process, is, you know, if it's something acute, it's going to come and go. That's no big deal. You can, you can live without food for weeks, right, months, actually. But what often kills people if you're an infant is this fluid loss. So this vomiting and diarrhea, you got to replace those fluids and electrolytes. And it's critical if you're an infant or a baby. You know. um, the morbidity is often uh, indeed complications of the disease, the spreading, the, the inflammation other than the absorption problem. But it is a problem. And if your gut is not working, you're not going to absorb your nutrients. I'm just letting you know that things like perforations and bleeding and obstructions uh, are more uh, usually more pressing than you're not absorbing enough calories. <clears throat> and you can lose a lot of your gut. The book talks about esophageal cancer. They can remove the esophagus and just connect the stomach up higher. Um, here, in this case, they took a piece of colon and put it there instead of the esophagus. They can use a piece of colon to make a bladder. They, can, they, they do some cool stuff. But, and then, of course, in some bariatric surgeries, they remove a big punch piece of your stomach big bunch of it. You can remove a meter of a uh, small intestine and be pretty normal. So we have, you know, a backup. We have a little more than we need. And I don't know if I talked about this, but our bodies too are, are, are not on the edge. We have a backup like that. We have two kidneys. You can live with one kidney. You can live with three quarters of a kidney, all right? Um, we only have one heart. So why don't we have two hearts, right? Because of heart disease? Well, you also can't over-design something. You guys... The example is that you buy a water heater, you know, and the, it has an eight year warranty. Why does it usually go bad? Like eight and a half years, something like that. So um, if you make a cheaper model, it's going to outsell the more expensive model in terms of evolution, right? So if you have a baby and you want to have a two hearts, the models with one heart are going to be able to have more copies of them. I don't know if I'm making this, this is too weird, but we are over designed. We have more gut than we need. We have more kidney than we need. Um, some things are closer, you know, but in many cases we don't need all of it. And so we can, our body has a little bit of, a, a, of a, a extra built into it. All right. So if you have uh, things uh, removed, colon cancer, they remove a piece of colon or a piece of stomach, um, they, can, uh, <clears throat> uh, they can do some things here. Like, for instance, if you lose a piece of the large intestine, because you had to because of cancer, they can do a, a colonoscopy or ileostomy, where instead of the waste going out the, the anus, it goes out through a bag, colonoscopy bag. So uh, it's uh, not fun, but it's, it's a way to, to, to get rid of your waste uh, if you need to do that. Um, when they bypass the stomach here, they, they leave the stomach attached because you make critical things like intrinsic factor and enzymes. And so they, they, they leave the stomach attached, but they just bypass it like that. Yeah. Um, so you can lose pieces of gut and be fine. They will just reattach them. There's a certain point where it's an issue and then, um, um, then they have to do some things. And if you lose gut and you can't absorb nutrients, they'll give you a tube feeding. They'll, they'll have a tube that goes in your stomach or goes in your nose into your stomach to give you nutrition if you need to on, on that end of it. And then you see total parental nutrition. This is where you replace your digestive system completely. This is where you get a formula that has all the nutrients that you need. And so you make it in the lab and you set it up in an IV. 
So we can live without our digestive system. It's not a way to live. Um, I love eating and good wine, good beer. And so, you know, this idea of uh, just getting all my nutrients, like if I'm an astronaut from a little tablet or from, that's just, you know, you lose all that joy of tasting it. But you survive. You can, we can do this. We have the ability to replace all this nutrition. Um, yeah, see, let's say they have to move like two thirds of your intestine or half of it. Well, you're not absorbing as much because you don't have as much of it. And so uh, you'll see fatty stools and uh, you're not absorbing enough vitamins and certain uh, um, nutrients. If you lose your large intestine, you're not gonna be able to get vitamin K enough of it. So uh, all these things need to be looked at. Uh, of course, you'll lose weight, you know, if you're not absorbing as many calories, definitely. All right, well, we end with that. Uh, total failure digestive system. We have backups to get you the, uh, the nutrients that you need, all right? So there we go. Um, trying to think. Everything we talked earlier about from the teeth down to the anus and things that can go wrong in all these different, these different levels. All right, you guys are doing well.